Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the live stream. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, I like to go live every single night to talk about something interesting each night that we have a topic or sometimes a special guest or sometimes just something that I like to demystify or a Monday rant or a Wednesday roundtable. That's tomorrow night. Uh, Thursday, I'm I'm pretty sure will be a night off because Friday uh, is virtual pub. I'll talk more about that as we get along later tonight. But Virtual Pub is this Friday night. It's also the same day as Outturn. So Outturn's at midday this Friday. Uh, first Friday of the month, first Friday of August, is when Outturn goes live without fail. Well, with the exception of November, December, but that falls on a different date. Anyway, good evening, Scott Brickhill. Hope you're well, mate. Good evening to Seamus Carroll, who left a comment earlier saying, show me your butts. Of course, he's referring to the theme of tonight's tasting, which is talking about casks. Um talking about casks and talking about um, size of cask, uh, influence of cask. Just some of the basics tonight, though. I don't want to go too nerdy on this stuff. I want this to be something that uh, members can tune into and um, and say hello. Hi to the Facebook user. Sorry, I'm on StreamYard. If you want your name to show up on the screen like it does there, then you'll need to authorize StreamYard to see your account or something. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about a couple of things to do with casks and um, what they are, and that means jumping over to this screen and seeing Flavor Invasion, of course, is the theme of this week's Outturn. It's an Outturn week. Hello, mate. Hello, everyone tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, so the idea about this is to talk about casks tonight, to talk a little bit about casks, talk about the influence, the previous use, where they came from, and why, and the why and the what, if you like, of, of whiskey casks. So we'll touch on a few things here. Let's let's dive straight into it because otherwise I'll just end up talking all night. Um, now, what I'm going to pour for myself is 64.114. It's one I bought for myself. It's a um, exuberant bounty of fruit, a 13-year-old sweet, fruity, and mellow. Now, the reason I've brought this up is because I've got a bottle here in my hands here, which you can see if you're on, the, on screen. But um, what I've got here is a 64.114. <laughs> There's the sound. I'm going to pour just a dram of that. Very enjoyably. Lovely. Just a small one. Um, one of 240. Now, the reason I brought this up on screen is because it says there on the screen it is one of 240, as I said, but the cask type is the most important part here that I want to touch on. It is uh, one, it's a refill uh, ex bourbon hogshead. Just let's remember that for a moment, okay? Don't worry about the other stats. We'll talk about other stats another night. Here we have a refill ex bourbon hogshead on the screen here, as you can see. Hope that's coming up okay for you all. This is a reefer bourbon hogshead. Let's talk about casks. So about casks and what they are and how they work. Also in outturns, like August outturn, which you're going to spot um, from this Friday, uh, is other casks which have a, a, a initial cask and then final cask. You can see them there. Uh, well, you can see them there now. So that's initial cask and final cask. That means it's had a um, – James, you're very, you're very close, very close, sometimes 250 litres. Most of the time, hogsheads are actually closer to 225 litre. But I'm, I'm being a pedant. But we're just going to talk about some of the basics of wood and the basics of casks here for a moment. So in this case, you can see this cask here has had uh, an, an initial cask of being an ex-bourbon hogshead like the, previous, like the one I'm enjoying now, but then has had a finish or a final maturation in a first fill ex-red wine barrique. First fill, first time it's been used. X red wine, that's the, the previous fill type of that cask, so X red wine. It's had a red wine in it before. And then barrique. You know what barrique is? Barrique, as Andrew said before on the stream, is a fancy French word for saying barrel. I almost got that wrong. It's a um, <laughs> power outage in Hobart. This is the only entertainment I had left. No, that's a that's a that's a good day for us all. That's a good day. If you're if you're in um, if you're in Hobart, you could watch this. Use, you know. Don't use up all your battery on your phone. I don't know how long your power outage is going to last. But you know what? I always get nervous about that when there's a power outage. Like, you know, how long will my phone battery last um, or my laptop battery? Anyway, back to it. Um, this is a 
like I say, a final cask of a first fill. So it's the first time it's been used post being used for red wine. X red wine barrique. And a barrique, like I say, is a French word for a barrel. So it's a French wine barrel. We can safely assume it's uh, it's French oak as well. So that's uh, that's very exciting. I think that's very exciting. It might be American oak. I don't know. But it's most likely French oak. Um, okay. So let's let's go on from there. I'm going to bring up the next slide. No, no. Got to love that. Can't go to the next slide. I want to show some pictures of – I've I've taken all of these photos, by the way, in my travels. Uh, this is um, – this is what the um, this is what it looks like over at Glen Murray Distillery. One of my favourites. Can anyone spot what those casks are? Those are indeed sherry butts. So I want to talk a little bit about sherried whiskey, um, the effects of sherried whiskey, and where they come from to begin with. Now, these are like so ex sherry casks. These are sherry butts. So when I say sherry butt, the first thing I mean there is that the butt, the word butt, b u double t, show us your butts, uh, is. Um, they, that refers to the size of the cask. I'm going to talk more about cask sizing as we go along. And the X sherry means that the previous fill of that cask was sherry. A popular um, fortified X Oloroso, X Pedro Jimenez type of cask. And we'll talk about other sherries later on. But this is this is the X that was X sherry. It was being used for sherry and now it's being used to mature whiskey. People often, uh, I think, put too much of an emphasis on sherry casks. Uh, they produce a lovely, often deep, rich, and dried fruits kind of profile. Um, sometimes other profiles you can find in there. Uh, you can often find sweet, fruity, and mellow uh, sherry, sherry butts. You can find even peated sherry butts, as we had recently with I Like Big Butts. It was a peated whiskey in a sherry butt. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, not the type of butts you were hoping to study tonight. <laughs> um, Joey says, going forward, if we have a bottle like that 64 that only describes one cask type, does that mean it's been fully matured in that cask? Joey, that is correct. If you see cask listed as refill X bourbon hogshead, in this case, it is a single cask whiskey. This is not something that's been transferred from cask to cask to cask. This is something that has only ever been in one cask from the date it was filled to the date it was dumped. So it's 13 years entire maturation in a single cask. However, if you see something... Um, <laughs> if you see something from um, that has a final and initial cask, initial and final cask, um, and Mark Teague says, my phone battery about to die after which my entertainment will be gone. Mark, you got to charge your phone if you're going to head, head into a blackout. Not that you knew blackout was coming, of course. Big hello from um, Alex Dahlberg, who says, hi from Baxter's, uh, Matt Bailey, love Ross, Lisa, and Alex. Ross, Lisa, Alex, all of you are Baxter's, love you all to bits. Hope you're all having a fantastic evening and social distancing and all that kind of stuff. I hope it's all really good. Chris Reed, uh, evening all. Finally signed up today. Been lurking for a while. Taxman may have helped me out this year. Chris, this is a personal shout out, and you've got your comment on the screen there. Big shout out to you, mate. Welcome to the society. Your whiskey journey's fully started now. This is fantastic to see you join up, Chris. I know we've been messaging back and forth, uh, both on the Facebook page and elsewhere, but always, um, always welcome to get in touch with us. You can always always call our office for some recommendations. You can always get in touch with us online. You know where, where we are. So um, and welcome aboard. James Caden says that James has been a member for a couple of weeks. You know what? Love to see new members jumping in on the live streams. It's it means a lot to me, and it means a lot to everyone. So this is great, um, Alex. This is great. By the way, thank you so much for tuning in from Baxes. By the way, how do you tune in from Baxes? You must be on their Wi-Fi because I know what the reception's like down there. Anyway, back to casks. So these are sherry butts here, and. They are generally, generally the biggest size cask used in Scotland for continuous maturation. Now, before I get any of the nerds jumping in saying, oh, what about, you know, tons and and what about um uh uh oh there are there's there's ton and there's one other one bigger than a butt. Well, it's been between a ton and a butt. Someone is gonna catch me out on that. I knew it. I'm gonna catch myself out. But look, the he's that that's the most common used, and they're uh, and they're always sherry, they're always ex-sherry. So I'm going to show you some of the pictures of what that looks like in the um, in reality. There is a um, a Fino warehouse. Isn't that just stunning? Is that just like a like a stunning piece, uh, a stunning photograph? That's a maturing warehouse of Fino sherry uh, in Jerez, in Spain. That's it, like you know, there's there's just even the architecture of that building is stunning. And then there's all these beautiful old Fino sherry butts just maturing away there in their um their Solera system, their Sistema system of racking those casks and and keeping the the Fino um maturing now two things i'm going to talk about just i'm going to touch on this for a second first of all pheno casks are very 
uncommon in Scotch whiskey maturation, in whiskey maturation in general around the world, A, is because it's a very expensive X type of cask to use. Uh, Fino is is roughly translates Fino fine finest. It's the finest grade of sherry. So generally, but if you do find a nice Fino sherry out there, grab one because Fino sherries are lovely. They're light. They're delicate. They're um they're like a I don't know how to describe a Fino sherry in tasting notes, but it's not what you expect if you think about those Oloroso characters and those Pedro Jimenez characters. It is not like that. These are like really light. Delicate, sometimes sweet, savory notes. So they're fantastic sherries. Uh, if you can find them, that's their Solera system. You can see there that they use. Um, obviously, the oldest casks are on the bottom. The newer casks are on the top there. They've even got a coating system there. You can you can probably just make out on the right. Uh, but they're not really desirable for Scotch whiskeys because they're expensive. And B, the results of what Scotch whiskey how it performs in Exfino is generally not that great. It's either uh, it doesn't influence the spirit very much. It's and it's Look, you got to remember, Scots are notoriously cheap. I love you all, but they are, and they they they're going to get the most out of casks that they can. And ex Oloroso and ex Pedro Jimenez casks can be seasoned and created for the purpose these days, which is most common for sherry casks. Uh, Chris, oh, cheers, Chris. Good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Um, tons of butts. <laughs> yes, Seamus. That's your third bum joke in his in his uh, little minutes. I think. Um, yeah, Fino is almost similar. Yeah, okay, actually, really, it's really interesting you say that, um, uh, Joe, because they are very similar. Uh, Fino is often a grading system, and it's, it comes from the same grape varietal. So it's, it's like Fino and Manzanilla are often uh, in the same category. Fino is just considered the higher grade. It's a bit like sort of if you were to compare it to, say, Johnny Walker's, it would be like the Fino is the blue label. I don't know. And the, and the Manzanilla is the gold label, whatever. It's just at the highest grade. And... Um, and that's and I have had uh, I've had plenty of finos and plenty of Monteados and pe uh, plenty of Manzanillas. So um, as you can see, there's different gradings on those casks and different levels of Solera and how long they've been sitting there. They sometimes mature sherry in these bodegas, as you can see in this photo. This photo here that they are sometimes maturing for uh, decades and decades, if not longer. Some of them maturing often for 70, 80, 90 years. So these are sort of projects that are laid down by previous winemakers that are um they never even get to see the, the end product of anyway i still think it's very cool anyway but i'm gonna be honest with you most sherry does not look um it does not look like this most sherry houses do not look like this most uh look like well for scotch whiskey production a lot of them look like this here you go now this is called a seasoning uh warehouse these are where casks are seasoned with sherry and they're often seasoned in between six to nine months most of them uh to create sherry casks so instead of 75 to 90 years, these are six to nine months. Does sherry, does seasoned casks provide a different level of uh, influence? Yes. Are they a different type of whiskey? Yes. Are they inferior to old school Solera whiskey? No. There you go. You heard it here first. They're not. It's simply not. There you have the old school production uh, of, um, of of sherry casks. And then you have sort of the seasoning, uh, the houses of seasoning, if you like, which provide a different flavor and sometimes don't overwhelm the spirit as much. So there's nothing wrong to be said about seasoning casks. I think um, uh, being like anti-seasoned whiskey casks or something, I think is a, is a silly position to take because you're not really comparing like for like ever. And uh, often even some of the, you know, early Solera, uh, Solera sh sherried whiskey that came out weren't that great. I mean, a lot of them were, but a lot of them were, a lot of them were over, overdone by a long shot. Uh, <laughs> Chris, tequila is the new salted caramel. Chris, it's only a matter of time until we see ex tequila casks uh, seeping into Scotch whiskey. I'll be surprised if we don't see it even like later this year or next. I'm sure we're experimenting with it. I couldn't comment on that. I don't know what the maturation policy is of uh, ex tequila casks, but I know we've got actually what I can divulge to you, which is rather exciting actually. The society has, I think, uh, about 78 different types of cask profile on hand at the moment. Out of the thousands of casks sitting in our warehouse, there's like 78 different ones, as in like different types. So, ex sherry, ex port, ex uh, Oloroso, ex um, Manzanilla, uh, ex tequila, whatever it is, is, like 78 of those kind of things, like which is kind of cool. It's like, you know, rather cool to think there's so much diversity going on across hundreds of different spirits and hundreds of different distilleries. Um, 
Okay, there's a really good question here from James Caden. Is there any way to determine whether the cask is European or American oak based on the cask size or type, or only if it is mentioned explicitly? James, um, the rule of thumb is that 90% of all Scotch whiskey maturation is in Quercus Alba American oak. Uh, 90%. Uh, Quercus Robur, which is American oak, accounts for about 10% now. So you, if, if you're wondering which one it is, it's probably American oak. European oak does often uh, produce a spicier, uh, nuttier profile, whereas American oak provides often a uh, creamier, more vanillin note uh, into the spirit. So without being explicitly stated, there's a lot of European oak out there. 10% of the industry is a massive amount. Um, but without being explicitly stated, you can. Uh, there's a lot of American sherry's uh, hogsheads now and even American uh, and American, obviously, lots of American oak everywhere. But European sherry butts account for a lot of it. Um, and then uh, and then you can drill down from there. There's obviously French oak and Russian oak and all that kind of stuff. But look, we'll, we'll come to that, James. We'll come to that. There's lots I can obviously... Uh, uh, extrapolate from this, even just tonight's quick chat. Um, John Jarvis is keen to do a tequila Hobart whiskey. Tell John that I thoroughly approve, and I think that Hobart whiskey are doing some uh, great spirits. He knows that. In fact, big shout out to John, by the way. Thank you so much. I've been slowly actually getting through all these. They're about all of them, are about two thirds full. So I've had a dram from each. Some of the goodies from them. So thank you so much for sending them over. Lots of things to taste there. Um, James, you're welcome. So um, let me go back to where I was. So this is a season. This is what seasoning factory looks like. Um, there's another photo from it. It's just massive amounts of um, production of casks that are being made for the maturation of sherried whiskey. Um, so Lachlan asks, curious about, curious about what influence cask size has on the spirit. Okay. Uh, do distillers choose a size of barrel in regards to what flavor they're hoping to get? Obviously, wood to spirit ratio would change things. There's sort of two questions there, Lachlan. I want to answer both, actually. So in terms of what distillers choose, most of them choose um, based on what their contracts are for their core range. So let's let's put it this way. A distillery like uh, Balmanac, a distillery like um, Glen Lossie, a distillery like Milton Duff, uh, Glen Allocky, whatever the distillery is, really, uh, most of them are filling into American oak. Most of them are filling into ex-bourbon American oak. Um, that might be first fill, that might be second fill. Some distilleries ex fill exclusively into second, third, and fourth fill casks. Um, a good example of that for a very, very long time, and I'm sure their policies changed a lot over the years, but for a very long time, a distillery like Ben Riak filled exclusively into refill bourbon uh, because a lot of these distilleries, you've got to remember, uh, were producing for blenders and often blenders exclusively. So if they're producing for blenders, the quality of the wood and the um, needing to be, you know, rich first fill casks with lovely vanillins and lovely uh, aromas coming off it, um, which are great. And second fills are also great. And third fills are also great. They're called refill casks. And refill casks provide a lovely balance of spirit to wood ratio often. Uh, but often the quality of wood has changed over time. And there's a lot of work going on now to, especially now, to actually improve that over time so that it can be far more marketable as a single malt and actually... Um, far more desirable as a single malt as well. So in terms of the influence of the cask size, spirit to wood ratio all just moves in, it moves in tandem with the size of the cask. So if you have a cask that is uh, 50 liters, uh, quite a small cask, um, it's going to be, it's going to mature. I say in inverted commas, it matures faster. Uh, and if you, and it, and if you have a wood, if you have spirit in a 500 liter, I'm pointing at nothing now, if you have a spirit in a 500 liter sherry butt, it matures slower. However, there are uh, exceptions to the rule and often uh, maturity, you still can't cheat time. Uh, every distiller should know this by now. You can't cheat time. So you can't put whiskey, you can't put spirit into a 20 liter, 50 liter, whatever small cask and mature it faster. It just absorbs the oak influence, the natural oils from that oak and the previous fill of that oak, if 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 applicable, uh, much faster. Now, uh, that doesn't mean it matures the spirit faster. It just means it's like slapping the cask on the back of the head and say, um, grow up faster. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like they're saying, you know, grow up faster and say, rather than, and which you can't do as a person, you can't do as a cask. So the, the, a lot of distillers choose 
based on uh, what they're going to use in their core range, that makes sense because the core range for them uh, these days, more and more a single malt core range is their, is the backbone of their expression. However, uh, a lot of distillers are moving towards um, uh, experimenting with cask types, which I'll talk about actually in a moment here. Let me go to the next few photos. Here we have some uh, lovely bourbon barrels. I'm going to show you what they look like in person. So, um, uh, well, so Denver, that's a really good point. That's a good point, Denver, but they're still not cheating aging. There's a few distillers around the world doing that now. It's not just Abomination. There's about four or five doing it now. Um, well, that I know of. There's probably even more. But there's a few in the States. There's a couple, there's at least two or three in the States and the two or three elsewhere. Now, they're, they're speeding up the, the process with hyper-aging. There's so many distillers have tried these things. They've tried hyper-aging. They've tried sonically aging. They've tried um, UV aging of casks uh, of the spirit. In the end, it still has the problem of being a um, over-oaked and under-aged spirit. You can't cheat the aging process. And even if you are to leach those oils out of the cask faster through science, you might get a whiskey or a spirit drink, uh, even if it's if it's not two years old. Uh, you might get a whiskey that is it is um, very oaky, uh, but the spirit hasn't had time to mature through the natural process of of that of that. Now let, let me let me look at this. Let me look, look at it this way. Look at it like an oak tree itself. Now you can plant an oak. You can plant plant oak seeds in the hopes of growing an oak tree. Now it takes what two hundred years to grow a fully a full sized oak tree. They're they're a long growing tree. Um, now let's say you instead of just planting it in soil and putting water on top, let's say you put heaps of like you know rapid soil and heaps of like quick grow and whatever all that stuff is you can get from Bunnings. You know you put you put all that sort of rapid grow. I'm not a gardener. You can tell uh, rapid grow into that. Denver, I'm answering this right now. And so you say you put all this rapid grow into that. It becomes it it's it might sprout faster. It might sprout faster, but you're not going to be able to cheat the fact that eventually that tree will end up being um, 60 inches wide and and um, 400 feet tall. So what I'm saying is you can't. Nothing will make that tree grow faster uh, and grow wider and mature the wood to mature. You can't cheat that. Just as you can't cheat the edging process in whiskey. Now, I'm happy to be proven wrong on this one day, but I haven't yet. I'm always happy to change my mind on this stuff, but I haven't yet. Um, question from Nick Hughes, can bourbon casks be filled with sherry, then emptied, and then used to mature whiskey? Yes, they, this they can. It doesn't happen very often, um, Nick. In fact, you see bourbon, ho sorry, you see um, uh, hogsheads being filled with uh, sherry for to be um, to be seasoned. Ho sherried hogsheads, uh, especially American sherry hogsheads, are becoming more and more common. Um, they're more versatile and easier to transport than butts. Um, and question, could you also fill a sherry barrel with bourbon and then empty then mature whiskey? Yeah, you could do that as well, Nick. Again, um, uh, I think with the price of sherry casks these days, because ex-bourbon barrels are cheap, ex-sherry casks are still quite expensive. I don't know any many distillers who would want to take that kind of gamble. Uh, even for one cask, it seems like if you get these great sherry casks, um, what would you, if you filled it with bourbon? I guess I, I mean what you might just get you might just sort of neutralize and get a lot more of those sweet vanillins through the sherry process rather than the sort of deep rich and dried fruits through it. It could do some it could be some interesting results out of that. Um, yeah, and Lachlan says he's definitely tried the sped up aging whiskey. Definitely doesn't taste right. I, they're fascinating whisk. They're fascinating spirits or whiskeys or whatever you want to call them. Don't get me wrong. I think they actually make some. There's some really interesting. Fast matured whiskey out there, fast matured, um, but it's definitely not. Uh, it's definitely not whiskey, and it should. I don't think it should be categorized as such, even. But that's another one. Um, and uh, Denver says, um, "Yeah, but been lucky enough to visit a few times and seen the progress. They're getting there. I'm totally a traditionalist, but the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, exactly, Denver. I'm a traditionalist as well, but the proof is in the pudding. And I've tasted all sorts of work in progresses. I even tasted a recent Abomination WIP." Which was a single cask, I think. Yes. Oh no, it was, a, it was a double cask. Sorry, at cask strength, that was bottled about six weeks ago. So that's, there's some really interesting stuff I've tasted just even just recently out of that distillery, and many others that are trying hyper aged. Uh, I don't think it's just. I just don't think it's there yet. Um, which yeah, Denver, we should have a debate on this. We really should. O says I won't have anyone say a bad thing about small casks when they have the cute name like Firkin. We're getting to the Firkin, Steve. Okay, I'll come back to questions in just a moment. Well, I would fucking hope not. Yes, James. 
you get that one for today. Look, I'll, I'll let me go back to where I was. I would. Uh, I was just saying that we've got some lovely uh, bourbon barrels there. That's what they generally look like. They're cute, aren't they? That's what, you know what you know what. I'm going to go out on a limb here. That's the size of a whiskey cask. That's a whiskey cask. Anything smaller, not worth playing around with. So that's a 200 liter barrel. Um, they are the most common barrel used. It's the ASB. They're called ASBs. I should point out. Uh, they're called American Standard Barrel. They're 200 liters. I won't go into too much of the history of that right now. Um, but, uh, oh, that's a really good point, Joey. You are correct. Nick Hughes, uh, Nick Hughes like I believe Wild Turkey did this with their Master's Keep. x Olorosa casks were used to age bourbon. That is true. And then maybe those X, those casks that can then be, um, those X bourbon sherry casks that can be used to mature something else maybe. That'd be cool. See what they do with them. Anyway, so let's move, moving on to the next, uh, the next slide here. Ah, oh, look at that. There's a, I've shown this photo before. I showed it in a live tasting. I love it though. So that's uh, Graham Cool, who's since moved on to Dingle Distillery in Ireland, but this is when he was working at Glen Murray a couple of years ago as master distiller. And he um, was distillery manager, I should, be, I should be more accurate. And there he is uh, nosing some of the fresh port pipes that have just come in. Port punchins, I should be more accurate, actually, port punchins. Um, so that's a punchin cask. Uh, it's a tall, it looks like a tall barrel. Looks, they call them the Cape Moss of casks. They're kind of like barrels. They're kind of like nice looking barrels, but even taller. I guess that makes sense. And then they, of course, after they're filled, they sit in these lovely casks, warehouses. That's a more of a Dunnage style warehouse. You can see how low the lights are and the ceiling is in that photo, perhaps. If you can't, um, I'll zoom in a little bit if you want. But you can see there's um, there's a tall, the, the really low ceiling, I should say, uh, racked only three or four high, and mostly three high in this room, and then a couple of fours up the top there. Um, very cool, uh, damp, dank environment to mature whiskey. A very traditional way of maturing whiskey. Dunnage is the Dunnage warehouse way of maturing. It means it's got a dirt floor like that one does, and it's it's uh, low ceilings and traditional maturation. It's also even maturation. You often see where, warehouses that are stacked eight, 10, 12 high, where it's a bit more sort of modern modern maturation. Depending on the distillery, they prefer to do different things. So, moving on to the next slide. Um, I'll just just showing a few things here. There is a mini cooperage, if you like, uh, of casks, way, a, a field of casks, if you like, a backyard worth of casks at Tullabadeen Distillery, waiting to be um, recouped and prepared for filling. A um, little bit of a close up there. Uh, I meant to take that photo out. Doesn't matter. Uh, just some, some some bits and bobs, some different types of casks, mostly um, mostly hogsheads of of maturing whiskey there. And um, and then some casks that I um, wish I could uh, even just dream of tasting, some 1959, 1956, 1953 whiskey there, 1960 next to it as well. That's very cool. So you can see they can often, they can often, often last a long time uh, maturing whiskey sitting around. Now, here's a more traditional cooperage. This is, of course, for those who have been there, you'll not know it, but this is the Speyside cooperage in Speyside, predictably. Uh, it's very cool to see uh, an old, like a, a modern but old school cooperage like this um, working on casks. You can see that there's a bloke here um, hammering uh, the hammering the lid in, I think he's doing there. And you can see all the, the bits of bamboo in the middle of the work desks, which are there to sort of uh, patch up and seal up the bits, uh, the, the staves together, keep everything nice and tight. Um, uh, this bloke here, the reason why I took this photo, this guy here making the cask actually has the world uh, Guinness World Record for fastest um, fastest construction of a whiskey barrel uh, in the world, where he built a barrel from scratch with the staves, heads, and, and everything together, and the the loops and the, the hammering and the construction. I think it was like two minutes thirty. Uh, if you can if you can build a cask in um, in two minutes thirty, then you're doing pretty well. Um, you know what we um, uh, where are we? Denver says thoughts on pressure seasoning casks. Pressure seasoning. I know about obviously sher like sherry seasoning. We we're talking about just before Denver. Pressure seasoning. I mean, I see. I don't see any problem with that. That's not you. You. You're. I'm all for modifying the cask as much as you possibly want and as much as you desire for the maturation of spirit. But I think that um, again, you can't pressure age something. It doesn't work in nature. And whiskey is nature. Whiskey is is the is the long aging of whiskey you can't cheat. You can make things taste like long aged whiskey. You can make things taste like interesting spirits. You can't cheat the aging process. There's nothing, I'm still not going to get around that one. 
Uh, and then, of course, that's what the finished product of these casks end up looking like at the end of the um, the end of the production line here at the Cooperage, um, which is rather cool. So they they just give the heads a quick spray to, to determine what they are. There's some uh, uh, hogsheads there, um, and that's you know whichever company's bought them has decided to go for the blue spray. So I don't know which company that is, but they would know. Here's some freshly uh, charred casks. I want to show you actually a bit of fun. Um, pressure seasoning was very common with Paxorette, James. You, you are correct. Um, modern modern Paxorette production does involve some pressure seasoning, but that's not – yeah, I won't go too far into that right now. But all, what I did want to show actually was um, what that seasoning uh, – what that – sorry, that, that cask treatment kind of looks like, and I thought you might uh, appreciate this. There we go. Hope that was just as fun for you as it was for me. There you go. So I took that video. That was video. These these casks and that video were all taken at um, Loch Lomond Distillery, just or we might call it Distillery One Thirty Five tonight. Um, there's some of the more more uh, more modern maturation at Loch Lomond, and um, there's some more modern maturation at Glen Scotia, and there's we're just nicely comparing a punchin to a hoggy there. Two of the uh, more, Two of them more common, punch and less so, but uh, just to just to give you a size example, and um, I stole this photo, but there you go. We've got a um, hoggy, a punch and, and a butt next to each other. Um, <laughs> says I'm buying a mixer. <laughs> but here you go, barrel, hoggy, and butt to give you an example. That photo is from outside uh, Ben Romack Distillery, and um, the hog's head just looks like a fat barrel and the butt looks like a fat hog's head. So they're kind of just all three sitting there. And just more examples of sizing. So I want to just finish on a few sort of points and notes here of some of the wording that you can use now um, to learn a bit more about casks and be that guy at the pub that knows all the answers. So the chime, the head, so the chime is that sort of that that ring around the top there, the top sort of stave chime, if you like, the, the branding, don't worry about that. The head of the, the barrel head, which is obviously a huge part of the maturation, uh, the hoops, the rivets that often go into the hoops, um, they don't always use that style of rivet, but they often do. The staves, which make up the whole construction of the casks, and the bung hole. And the bung uh, is often silicon, especially modern bungs these days are silicon bungs because they're just easier to manage, easier to get in and out of the cask without using a screw and a and a um or a you know a nail and a and a hammer pull to get the bungs out to see how they're going. It's much much faster to do. Um, but there you go, and the bilge is the widest part of the barrel. So here you go. That's that's our, our sort of our, our quick our quick sort of rundown on casks tonight to talk about a few things if you like, and to see what you know. Just some of the basics, some of the basics of seeing the sizing. I want to talk about cask sizing tonight, and that's where we touched on about barrels, hogsheads, butts, puncheons, and a couple of bits about the different American oak versus European oak. It's always oak though. Uh, oak is um, it's naturally full of recurring oils. Of occurring oils, I should say, and uh, are called vanillins, as I said before. The spirit draws them out um, during maturation. Um, but those with other characteristics in the wood, uh, it, it always varies on depending on the roots of the wood, whether it's American oak or um, European oak, it, it varies. Um, the good thing about oak, however, in the whiskey industry is that it's it's readily available, it's tough, uh, it's easy to work with, and it's a tight grain, uh, it's a tight grained wood, which makes for um, very Little, no, very like little to no leaking anymore, uh, and it, but it's still just porous enough to allow whiskey to interact with the air a little uh, outside. So there's your good argument for uh, terroir, which is another night we could do talk about terroir, of course. But um, that's where I want to start on tonight. The reason why I'm referencing some of this stuff is because people often see these markers on our bottles in our turn and go, "What does a hogshead mean?" Well, now you know a hogshead is basically just a reconstructed barrel. And it, in this case, it's a refill hogshead. You can learn more about this on our um, on the society website, and you can always ask us. But we've got a really cool little article, which I'll be, I'll I'll say it is called Distilled Delorean, taking a trip back in time of d distillation and and when it came about and when it was made and all that kind of stuff, and scaling the the, the period of history and just to see how new single malt really is uh, in comparison to anything else. So thank you again for tuning in. Always a pleasure.
I will see you tomorrow night for a round table. We've got two special guests on, at least one, at least one. Lisa Truscott, uh, formerly of Redlands, now at Archie Rose, um, is joining us. She is a distiller at Archie Rose. And we'll, of course, we'll have Alex Dahlenberg, Andy Milne, and myself. Scott's judging gins or something, so he can't make it. But in the meantime, uh, hope you all have a fantastic night. And um, and and <laughs> I don't think I've got anything else I need to say. But in, as I said, our turn is this Friday. Virtual Pub is this Friday, uh, 7 p.m. this Friday. Uh, excellent geeky episode. It wasn't even meant to be geeky, Denver. That's all right. It was just talking about some of the basics of cask sizes tonight. And um, I really appreciate you tuning in, everyone, and um, and being a part of the society. We go live every single night, every single night, and we're looking forward to um, um, doing some more in the next few weeks. But I'll see you this Friday. Sorry, I'll see you tomorrow night, but Friday's virtual pub. That's all I want to say. In the meantime, everyone have a great evening, and I'll catch you all soon. Cheers.